everybody um, to the next Megacon seminar. This one is by Jim Woolman, who probably needs no introduction. Uh, he's probably the father of Mega Games. Uh, certainly brought me and many other people into the hobby uh, through Watch the Skies. Uh, but today, Jim is going to talk about creating legacy Mega Games. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Jim. Thank you. Um, so welcome to creating legacy Mega Games. Um, and I'm quite impressed that uh, uh, at how this the whole idea is kind of developed over time. Um, and um, what I'm going to do this afternoon is have a canter through uh, perhaps a few principles that I think I might have identified, a few a few thoughts about um, what you need to consider in uh, constructing a game or a mega game specifically. Um, over more than one session. And um, I've experimented with this uh, various times over the years from doing a uh, <clears throat> two day mega game uh, to recently doing a, a four weekend uh, online mega game. But, and also it, it been involved, as I suspect many people have been involved in ongoing kind of campaign type things. And, it, and it, there's some similarity in this to um, say ongoing role playing games where you, you know, you're doing session to session and some of the, the lessons from that, um, I think, are applicable. So <clears throat> what do I know, which is a won't take very long. Um, I've, I thought I'd come up with something that sounded groovy. Um, so I've come up with the four C's, somewhat shoehorned four C's into this. Um, and <clears throat> what I've identified are, are things that are important, credible setting, continuity of play, continuing narrative. That was the one that I shoehorned and committed participants. That's, um, uh, those, those are kind of four areas and I'm gonna talk about those four areas. And just to set the scene, having talked about it um, and uh, <clears throat> explored my thoughts on the subject, I'm gonna get you to do some things. So be ready for this. Um, so once I've stopped talking, hopefully um, we'll have time for you to do a, a practical exercise involving everybody uh, listening. Um, and um, uh, so don't just doze off. Well, you can doze off, of course, but um, be ready to put some, try and put some of this into a little practical exercise um, in the second part of the, this talk. So four principles, credibility, continuity, narrative, and commitment. <clears throat> uh, where do we go with these? Credibility. Now, this is something that um, I feel is important anyway, in any game, um, genre fiction, uh, the best genre fiction has to be credible. Even if it's a fantasy or even if it's science fiction or if, it, if there's some element of um, the fantastical, there's a credibility that this, that this has to have its uh, internal logic and encourage a willing suspension of disbelief. And I think we've all experienced watching a, a film or, or um, reading a book where you just go, oh, that's just too silly for words. And you lose, start to lose the plot a bit. And the same goes for historical fiction, paying its debt to history. Uh, you, if you're reading something which claims to be historical fiction, you really do want a bit of history in there that is, and I use the term suitably accurate. Um, it might be alternate history. It might be events take place in a slightly different way or in, involve characters that are fictional but the environment has sufficient accuracy that it is believable. And I'm going somewhere with this because obviously it's, I believe it's the same for games. And that poorly thought through, i.e. incredible or internally illogical fiction and also games become, can become tiresome uh, and start to lose their way a little bit um, because they're not grounded in anything. And again, we can find examples where it's just like, well, that's just, barking mad um, and in some ways <clears throat> barking mad can be fun um, and crazy outcomes um, happen in mega games and it's hilarious um, however when we're talking about legacy games I think I believe there's a degree of care that is required um, to ensure that the the madcap crazy events that come out of games which are bizarre or or, or um, super fantastical, that these don't 
hamstring you when you want to do the second part or the third part or the fourth part of your legacy game. So in a sense, it's beware the craziness. <clears throat> that doesn't mean to say that in theory, it's not possible to do a game which is utterly crazy in a legacy format, but I believe this is a constraint that we, we have to pay attention to. Continuity. So if you're running games across a period where there's a game, there's a gap, there's another game, the things that I consider, and I think are worth considering, are the, uh, think about the player's perspective. So you've played the first part of the game and things are going really, really badly. Um, there's, there's a, it's just, you know, we're, you're being demolished by the other teams. Everyone's ganged up on you. You've got, you, your government's fallen. Your armies are defeated. The aliens have invaded every one of your cities. <clears throat> and it's the end of the first session. Are you going to come back? Do you really want to continue playing the game? Some people might. Some people like to be on the, the losing uh, side, like to be uh, up against a challenge. But you need to consider, in terms of constructing your game, what the range um, of possibilities of outcomes and how you handle continuity when one team is losing or conversely, one team is clearly winning. You get to the end of your first session, one team is dominating the entire game. Everything that happens is entirely under their control. Everybody else is singing to their tune. Is that a situation that you want to have? And, and is that a situation your game structure has allowed? And then when you get to your second game, um, or your third game or whichever, and you have players who are um, starting up, maybe who've just joined the game, who couldn't make the first session and are making the second session. What if they didn't want to start from there? What if they are dumped into a team where it's all gone horribly wrong uh, and that they, they are um, in a position that they really don't have any confidence in? Or alternately, um, what if you're, you, you join a team partway through the game Part through, through the series and your team is completely dominating and you've got no challenge. So thinking about how you make that transition, that continuity transition between uh, what happened in the first game or the second game or you know what then happens in subsequent games. And the other one is, does anybody remember what we did last time? Um, and that's the question which needs to be kept in mind is that there's a requirement for some sort of record keeping or continuity recording between games that is consistent and uh, doesn't require people necessarily to remember what happened. Narrative. So this is pretty important. Um, oh, sorry, we, we dealt with the main problem of the game, last game, and we've solved that. Uh, so if your narrative is one which has a clear ending, um, a point, a, a, a planned denouement, which uh, on the whole, I don't tend to have in my games, but it might happen, um, or, or as has, does happen in things like Watch the Skies, there's a kind of big reveal at the end, or not a big reveal, but there's a reveal that comes up through the game. Well, once you've done that, where do you go? So games which are structured around a narrative or a plot, um, which is completable within one session, then you have to think, well, does your game narrative support multiple iterations? Does it work? Um, does it create a story which can keep going either indefinitely or for the known length of time uh, that your game is uh, taking part in? And that leads on to the narrative being open, too open or too closed. So one of the features of, of mega games are their openness that within the context of your game, within the, the story or background of your game, players have the freedom to do anything they could do in reality or they could do within the, the imagined world that you've created. Um, and that we, the control team, facilitate that, support that, allow that to happen. Um, however, if you're constructing a narrative that you think is going to run over multiple sessions, that could be quite wide ranging, um, is that too open? You've given people freedom of action. At the end of the first session, things are so uh, far away from what you imagine might happen that the start of the next game is pretty much a new game. Have you just uh, multiplied your problems 
uh, by being too open and giving your players too much choice. And the converse of that is, have you uh, closed the, the narrative so much that actually there isn't very much they can do that's not predictable over that period of time? Have you, have you constrained them in too many ways? So the, the, there are pitfalls in maintaining the narrative across multiple games um, and uh, trying to do that is, is, is in my view, non-trivial. Uh, one of the get out clauses, of course, is that at the end of the first game, if it's really not working, you can kind of start again and say, well, I know you played that game, but it's a parallel universe or it was all a dream. And actually your start position is one that, that we can control and we can manage. And there are obvious pitfalls in that as well. One of the things I, I did between the large Watch the Skies games was to have small amounts of continuity, but not a complete um, uh, legacy connection. So we used elements of plot that had developed in previous games, but explicitly didn't, didn't make it a continuing timeline. And each game had its own features and was different, but drew on plot elements that had, that had been created from emerging gameplay in the previous game. That's not strictly speaking a legacy game. Um, and it was a way of getting around having some sort of um, narrative legacy without actually constructing a legacy mega game. So your narrative is, in in my view, in my view, pretty important to think through. Uh, coming back to the the, the previous uh, slide about thinking through a credible narrative that you can continue across uh, multiple games without either driving yourself mad or constraining the players. Um, and, and time spent thinking about that, um, brainstorming it with others, sitting down and talking it. And interesting, a term in, uh, that came up in um, Max Vince's session earlier, red teaming, something we use in the professional field quite a lot, is you have someone who sits, who's able to sit there and say, well, what if, what about? How about, what if the players do this? What if the players do that? What if it goes, what, why, why wouldn't the players just fill in the blank? Um, so that you, you having a critical friend who can constructively uh, deconstruct your ideas of, for narrative, because if you're constructing a legacy game, you're committing quite a lot across a period of time and the opportunity for it to go wrong uh, is considerable. Um, and that leads me on to commitment. Um, you've got your legacy mega game. You've got a team of players who played in the first game, had mixed feelings about it. <clears throat> in the second game, only one of them comes back. And you're filling in, you're backfilling teams with people who really, really want to play the game but couldn't get in last time. So there's this thing about commitment. Now, I was pleasantly surprised when we did, uh, we made it earlier this year in that we had really high commitment from our player teams. We had very high return rate, um, but we had to plan for what do we do if, if players drop out as, as, over, as we were asking them to play four sessions on four consecutive weekends. And knowing how weekends fill up, uh, I was certainly very concerned that that might uh, go horribly wrong and we'd end up with four people playing the game by the end. As it happens, we had pretty much everybody playing the game by the end. Um, and uh, which was very satisfying. However, that was possible because there was a clarity at the outset about what commitment was required. Um, we, had a, we had a kind of plan B about dropouts. And the key part for me in that was also how to manage the time, the interregnum, the time between sessions. Uh, when we were doing We Made It, um, the concern was, that players would just keep playing for the week in between um, and uh, the game wouldn't stop. And which is a, uh, an interesting um, perspective because what we were worried about was that not everybody can commit to playing, the, playing a game for four weeks, 24 seven. And so we had to make it very clear that it was uh, that into uh, in, in between game sessions, players did not do gameplay. 
which also encouraged people to come back because they wanted to see what happened um, and also allowed for the fact that, that people had lives and that not everybody, some enthusiastic players might have kept playing for all uh, seven days, others uh, couldn't commit to that. So being clear, clear about managing the commitment and, um, and having that clarity with the players is very important and creating a boundary. So not just saying, well, we're doing this game every month or every couple of weeks or whatever it is uh, and letting players sort themselves out. We said uh, explicitly, do not play between sessions. Um, and we, I think that helped. Um, uh, certainly people manage the commitment um, similarly, back in the olden days, we ran a two-day mega game, um, the last war, and I had similar concerns. It was like, well, would people come for both days of the weekend, um, at full, two full days of mega gaming over two days? And again, despite my uh, uh, doom saying, um, we had a massively high uh, replay, but I think it was almost everybody played completely for both days. And um, and that was that was effectively not so much a legacy mega game as one mega game played over two days, and it's kind of difference I think in that in that it was it was uh, the board set was continued to be set up and everything remained in place when they finished playing and they just walked back in and carried on playing the next day. With the legacy mega game, um, what you're trying what you're trying to do I think is uh, build on the past. Um, have that continuity over a long period of time. Um, my final point on commitment is control burnout. Really important um, is that uh, we rely on our control teams to make these things work, um, and we and and being in control can be uh, intense. And so when we did, um, we made it. As a conscious decision for each team, each team in the game really only needed one control to run it, but we we recruited two controls for each team, and that was precisely to deal with this: that you do need to consider um, how you um, organise the control so that they have time to recover or time to recharge, or even somebody else to help them. Um, and so, when we had the two two controls they were able to support each other. And it also meant that if the worst happened and one of our controls couldn't make it or was otherwise incapacitated, we had a controller who could continue running it at least for a session. And uh, as it happened, our controls were there throughout, uh, managed su superbly. And um, I would say, and I would get feedback from them maybe, um, but I would say they enjoyed themselves and um, that it was a positive experience for them because they were able to, to kind of keep going. Um, the other thing on terms of commitment, which we did for We Made It, which was a also a change was that each of the mega game sessions were only four hours. So once again, the players were asked for what sounded like or seemed like, and probably was a smaller uh, commitment. They hadn't given up their whole day. The game was being played in distributed form, so they didn't have to travel. And uh, so it was relatively straightforward for them to connect up with the game. And so four four hour sessions, which is kind of, if you like, you know, two and a half mega games or something, um, seemed more manageable for people, I think. That's the kind of impression I got. So um, so managing the, the commitment, managing the expectations and dealing with control burnout are quite important. So I thought there ought to be a diagram in any um, uh, presentation of any sort whatsoever. So I've, I've invented the legacy triangle, uh, even though there were four things. Um, if you like, the, the middle thing is the, the um, successful uh, legacy game, but if you can balance the, the, the three most important things, your a credible continuing narrative um, and commitment of participants, then you those are the things that kind of bring together your thinking and uh, help you construct a, um, or at least make a stab at legacy mega games. Now, what I, what I would 
say at this point though is that um, this is still in in my experience this is still quite early days in in developing this um, certainly my initial um, view is that there's there is still an awful lot more work involved in um, legacy mega game than in, in, in not just you know if you're doing three legacy games that are linked it's more than three times the work um, because of this con this connectivity issue um, and also there's a uh, I come back to the issue of credibility um, there is also managing the craziness across three games it is a challenge what we found in we made it um, was that actually uh, we navigated last turn madness in quite an interesting way so on the one day event we all know last turn madness is a thing it's not just a thing in mega games i've encountered it in very very serious games in very very grow in inverted commas grown up environments i've seen last turn madness um what we found in we made in we made it was that first of all for the first three sessions of the four sessions it wasn't the last turn they all knew that they had another they were coming back to this by the time we got to the end of the fourth session, which was the last turn, and they knew it was the last turn, the players had become so invested in the narrative of their store of the colonies that they'd built, the story that they had built, there was no way they were going to blow it up at the end or go crazy and start shooting people. They were invested in this thing they had built. And so I noticed a, a marked drop off in last turn madness simply because there was a huge investment already and nobody wanted to break what they'd done or what anyone else had done. So I think that's an interesting finding. What it's not, it's anecdotal, but um, uh, what I, I mean, I have mixed views about last turn about this. Sometimes it can be hilarious. Uh, sometimes it can be a culminating part of the narrative. Sometimes it can just be plain daft. And, um, and any, for my money, anything that reduces the plain daft bit and encourages something that's actually genuinely interesting or genuinely entertaining um, uh, has to be a good thing but that's just my opinion um, um, so I'm going to get you to do a job now because I've talked enough and, um, and thank you for listening at least so far uh, I would like you to just have a discussion as your as groups about the, the running a legacy version of, a, of Watch the Skies. I choose Watch the Skies because most people know roughly how that goes. Um, and certainly there'll be people who, who know it well. And it, imagine that you are going to be setting up a legacy version, multiple iterations of Watch the Skies across a series of sessions. Um, and, uh, and what makes it, what is different in how you would run that and, and just talk through and a few things that that um, you might consider how to keep players engaged, what to do about control burnout, uh, how might the original narrative develop? It would probably need to. Um, how might a new narrative? So if you if you on the one hand you might talk about the you know those who know the original narrative that really only works for in my view only works for one session, but what would happen if you had to try and make it work for more than one session? And then if you decided, well, actually, we're going to have an entirely different narrative around the aliens for um, the legacy game, what new narrative might you create that was credible? And I go back to my point about credibility, not just let's make up some stuff about aliens, but what really feeds a, a credible narrative. Do a bit of intern in your groups, do a bit of red teaming about what what might be the, you know, what might or might not work if we do, if we create a new narrative. How might players break it? And then in general, what could possibly go wrong? So what I'd like to do then is, is if we can um, take you in turn, if we start with, if we can then, if Jerry's, whoever's doing one, I've only got, who have I got? Uh, right, so there's a whole game in who gets selected to speak, isn't there? Um, yeah. All right, so let's start off with Jerry, uh, some feedback on what, what okay. I did in my workshop. Um, player and, and 
I'm, I'm reading from Becky's notes. I wasn't there at the beginning bit. So they were looking at player engagement. We're looking at time jumps um, of uh, um, one session in 2025, then 2030, then 2035, with a gap for the designer to consider how the world would change. Possibility of different groups being introduced later on. For example, aliens that just arrived on Earth. It doesn't matter that they don't know what the situation was in the ground. Um, we, we, we also, that then causes to say, well, hang on, was, is this online or in person? Because um, there's challenges in getting to people to travel to attend. Um, but the thing about the uh, 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 different, you could, although you want to have a continuity of some continuity, you don't have to have all of the players at all of the games. So if there are some people for re reasons, personal reasons, couldn't definitely couldn't say, I definitely couldn't do four sessions, but I could do two sessions, they, then maybe you can have them come in later or come in for some bits and not others. Control burnout, I think that was already um, mentioned about duplicating control roles, but particularly we needed them um, handover for control and notes so that con control doesn't need to be the same week on week. Although, of course, not having the same control is a challenge for the building the report with your team. But that's that. Other challenges are playing, getting in with the aliens and getting far ahead on the tech track, player dropout. We've said we, we could maybe have a reserve list of players who may be able to join the later session. Um, redundancy, well, you can have bigger teams, but then they that can run with not but with smaller numbers. But, but that does have problems of its own. Um, so it does mean that players with redundancy, if you put redundancy, does that mean players have less agency and therefore are not so likely to become engaged and therefore more likely to drop out? Difficult, don't know. Um, does add, adding more player add uh, the benefits of complexity with different viewpoints? Um, and that's about as far as we got. Okay, thank you. Um, let's uh, move on. What, what we'll do is we'll get both presentations and then hopefully we can open up some more questions um, about the exercise and then we'll go on to general Q&A. So, Pickles. A off the cuff thing for me. Um, for engagement, we fundamentally think um, that you can use cliffhanger type effects where they're either external, like you get new aliens arriving at the end of the session, so the players are interested in finding out what happens, or they're developing a project and the results of that project will only come through in the next session. So they, they, they want to see what comes to that. So that their, their plans are only partly resolved in a session. So they're, they're, they, it's not like a climactic ending, there's more of a, a cliffhanger, as we said. Um, for control burnout, uh, as well as having redundancy, we have more control players um, than you need. You could maybe rotate rotate them into player roles where you've got a role like the aliens who could possibly be a rotating cast of different aliens visiting each time so that the control crew get to play a bit as well as controlling um, or even something like a democracy where the, the, the people in power may be completely different next time the game takes place. So you could swap the team for a control team um, provided that you know, everyone's got to be somewhat on board about that, of course. Um, so the next bit was narrative. Uh, the original, how the narrative develops. Um, the team structures might change. So you might get the aliens with seats on the UN councils or like the aliens may occupy um, Antarctica and form a, a nation there, which would change the way the whole game's structured. Um, we felt we had to be reactive with your narrative. You can't, you might have a great idea for something to happen in the second uh, session, but you, if the play, if the way the game plays takes a different turn, you, you want to make sure that you're not sticking to your baby rather than letting the players have their game, their, 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 their wants, rather than letting the narrative develop naturally, if you're trying to say. Um, and again, you can have gaps in the story, as the other lot said. So you don't play continuously, you play a, a couple of years out of every 10 or 50 or 100. Um, and that lets you push the game back on course if it's gone badly off course. Like if you're worried about one team getting too strong or too weak, you can have have it like ease back to a more normal position between or, or embrace it pain maybe. Um, but you could also recast your teams so that if one team has got very big and powerful, you can add some players to that team and uh, remove them from other teams if they become redundant. Again, you, with that, there's a risk of losing player engagement, but it might be better than um, having them a huge team of people with no power. 
um, and whatever goes wrong, you can try and patch. So in response to what could go wrong, well, all the usual things can go wrong, but you get a chance to patch them in the gaps between the, the sessions. So if something has gone wrong, you, you do get a chance to address it. Um, and ideally, it's, it's not a structural problem that you have to rewrite the game for, of course. It's just something that's gone a bit haywire. Um, so you can play the games at a more measured pace as well. So you need to allow time to between games for the design team to absorb what has happened and feed it back into the next iteration. And also having a quite measured pace would allow players not to burn out so much probably. Um, and if we are playing live, it would keep the costs down because you don't, wouldn't have to travel mm. over and over again to the um, you know, to, to play every every couple of weeks. Uh, and I, I think I suspect these games are more suited to online style play anyway. Uh, it's easier to get people together because not, not, they're not actually together, of course. Uh, I think I've covered everything on my little list, so I'll hand it back to Jim. Thank you, Pickles. Um, and um, I've, we've got uh, we've opened up the uh, Zoom channel. So actually, is any other any other comments from any of the teams on the exercise or, or anything they'd like to add to what their spokesperson has fed back uh, on what they thought um, around that challenge of uh, conversion? It seems to me that there's a different <clears throat> a different variety of um, of legacy games. I mean, we had you know, it was the one that we did when it was over the four weekends, but just the story continuing. Was that just the one game, and it was just done over the you know, the, you wouldn't really keep call each weekend a legacy game, or would you? Um, compared to one where you might have. Um, well, this one of Watch the Skies, where you might be able to then at the end of that, you know, sort of like a couple of months later, have another game where it's, um, you know, 50 years into the future and what's happened in terms of Earth and the aliens and the alliances that may or may not have been built um, and start a whole, you know, it's, it's sort of almost like a standalone game, but it's built on, the, you know, it is a legacy game in terms of it's got a history that was prior to the game. So, so I guess you know what was the one where we did it for four weeks in a row? Was that was that a a serial game? Was that a legacy game? Was that just the one game spread over the four weeks? Yeah, it's an interesting question, isn't it? It's mm. like, um, and and I, well, hey, look, this is a mega game conference, so we have to talk about definitions, don't we? Um, so I, I I'm really hesitant about coming up with a definition of what or is or is not a legacy game. Um, but I think there's a, yeah, you know, play, playing what was effectively one game with the same players and the same controls mm. over four weeks. Does that have, a, that has elements of legacy in that what, yeah, the end state at one set was the, uh, at one session was the beginning state of the next. But, um, uh, and I think Terry mentioned um, Yendor, you know, we're, tomorrow we're doing an iteration of Yendor. That's not, strictly speaking a legacy game except that it has narrative elements which i've just uh repeated across several games so i've created a fantasy mm. background use that now is using this a consistent um imagined world uh is that does that uh, open question to you uh you people do you think that is a legacy would that qualify as a legacy or is that merely just using consistent background that you modify it as a result of the outcomes of games there's something to be said um about it's almost as a campaign game which maybe we made it was more of a campaign game we have different sessions but it's one game one story there's no mechanical reset whilst something like uh the urban nightmares we did jim the, the two that was more of a legacy game. We have a mechanical reset and a gap. That makes sense. Yeah, true. The, the Urban Nightmare London Calling um, wasn't. It didn't restart at the point at which the previous game ended. Mm, mm. Um, and and that was and the connect between it was deliberately vague because I first of all I didn't really have a mechanism for capturing the exact game state, but what I did have was a story, which which informed the start state of the second game. Um, and, uh, and so it was a, you know, same map, same mechanisms, closely related scenario, 
which the back brief was the events of the first game or the key events of the first game. And then maybe that's a better definition of a legacy game. I don't, um, I don't know. It, Jim, perhaps, um, is it a legacy game where if you weren't playing the character that you played before, would be something that would, would make you probably not want to do it or would make it very difficult for you because you'd invested so heavily in the character. And I'm thinking particularly of the Endor games and because, of, no. because there are a large number of people that have played, although there's been lots and lots of new people in lots of them, there have been people that have played the same character quite for quite a, a good many years now. I think that, for me, that's a consequence, not a definition. Yeah, you know, I, I, that that would be where I'd go with that. I mean, yes, if you if you like anything else, you know, you kind of involve with it on and off over a long period of time. You you invest, um, but I, I yeah, I, I see that as a if you like. So is that a legacy payer? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and we do have that too. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That has its pros and cons as well. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah. Oh, but because I think your your the question that you posed a bit earlier with the Endor in terms of if you're using a, a, the, the same game components or something or other, I can't remember the exact the same, term you used. Using the game background. Yeah, but does that mean the narrative has actually changed? And is narrative? I mean, to me, narrative I would it was part of your definition, and I'm wondering if you still have you'd have a different narrative, wouldn't you? If you didn't, if you, even though you might have used the same. Yes. So. In the case of Yendor, yeah, you know, I, I use the, the, some of the stories from previous Mega Games set in that environment to create the the history. Yeah, it's been a it's been a uh, emerging kind of history history fantasy history project. So, no. In a way, um, sorry. In a way, isn't the original Watch the Skies um, sort of a legacy game? Because wasn't three a follow on? From, from the the way three and four were both followed on from the end of two because it had the citations. I don't know yeah. if I'm saying that correctly. Yeah, yeah. They so, so I did the same thing with Watch the Skies three and four after Watch. You know, we had all sorts of craziness in in two, um, hard to follow. And um, but I did the same thing. I'd, I had a reasonably consistent background and then um, took key points of the narrative from the previous game and made them part of the history for the subsequent game but i didn't do a well end of end of watch the skies 2 is the beginning of watch the skies 3 it mm. was just kind of mainly because i couldn't i didn't have the information i hadn't recorded enough of what happened in what's i mean god knows anybody if anybody knows what happened in any of those watch the skies do tell me because i haven't got a clue no um and um so <laughs> I think that's one. I feel like that almost that's like legacy light, you know. It's like, well, we're bringing we're bringing on some elements of the previous plot. Some people who played in the previous game will recognise that there are some elements of the previous plot that are the the start point for their game in the, the subsequent game. Um, and that's if you like the lightest touch of like, for me. It seems like the lightest, easiest, least effort way of of creating a sense of legacy. I think those can be so rewarding for committed players. Um, I do um, an immersive theatre thing called the Lucky Ones, and that ha and that's in its third iteration, or was in its third iteration this year, and it and it had elements of previous runs, both the previous runs in it that you know would be glossed over by by your your casual player, but for your really really committed people who notice them, it just feels so rewarding and like you're getting this sort of special thing. That's sort of like a gift to yourself and that. So yeah. I really love those elements in mega games. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Or or indeed, I mean, broaden it a little bit. Any more general questions? And we've kind of I think we've covered quite a lot of ground. Yes. Why do you want to do it, Jim? Other than it's because you haven't done it before. I don't want to do it. Who said I wanted to do it? <laughs> okay. Well, I mean I was I'm just exploring the issues around it right i i, I yeah. oh, sorry becky you go ahead thanks yeah uh, uh, this has inspired me and it's making me think i can do trope pie and like you know taking you through all four years of of, of american high school rather than just one year but i don't know how oh, it's it's, a, it's return as 50 year olds that you want to do 
<laughs> oh, so so trope high and then oh, trope high the reunion. Yeah, like yeah. I do like that idea. Oh yeah. my god. <laughs> there we go. Inspiration strikes. Yeah. Any other any other comments, Alex? Mirror mirror shades. There was um, one reason why I was uh, looking at doing something along these lines a while ago. Um, which uh, I was trying to develop a game on the Saxon settlement of England, which takes about 200 years to go from Rome to Saxon kingdoms. And that's too long a period to do in one game, I felt, to get any meaningful input. So playing a series of games um, with the same, the end state from one game feeding into the next game was one reason that I wanted to look at that. Um, and also because we're talking about playing mega games at conventions and playing a series of short games rather than one really long game would fit better to the typical convention schedule mm. but people can just drop in for a four hour slot instead of a whole day yeah. so there, mm. there was reasons why i was sort of messing around with something a similar type of idea at one point but that's like three ideas ago now at least so, <laughs> <laughs> so i haven't really, really looked at it for a while but, yeah. but there, there was a practical slot where it was a, a meaningful thing to try and look at rather than just just a, a concept um, yeah. so. I think just my thinking on this is that I think it's a really interesting different set of ways of doing this. And I think we've covered all of them, but as we say, there's a difference between maybe a campaign serial type game, there's a legacy game, and I think there's a game where you play with the same players or where it's just the theme to the legacy for the next time you're on the game, but for maybe totally different players. So I think there's such a big design space here. Um, mm. You can do a lot with it, I think. Yeah. I was, um, I was particularly inspired by an over chance overheard comment as I was flipping between the uh, discussion rooms earlier was a comment from Pickles about one of the great joys of legacy board games was when you get to the next legacy game you get a box of new components and bits and pieces mm. and the joy of opening the box to find out what the new components were for the next stage of the game and I thought oh now that's actually quite an interesting um, phenomenon so you know you turn yeah. up your make your second mega game and there's a whole load of new powers, new abilities, new things you can do, um, or something. But um, I, I recognise that you, you can easily imagine how that's a, a really, um, you know, a, a, am I right, Pickles? You said the game wasn't all that good, but you like... Yeah, as I said, I think some, some, some of these games, that is the whole benefit of them. The, the game's just terrible, but <laughs> have that, that sense of discovery that you get. And so, <laughs> but, not yeah. that I remember ever negative about games, right? But, so basically, um, <laughs> I can do any old crap as long as I have a goodie bag. He obviously has pirate yeah. blood and he just likes finding treasures, going on treasure hunts and yeah, I'm with you, Pickles. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah different, different people's buttons, doesn't it? Because yeah. yeah, yeah. one of the things that, that I really enjoyed about the early Endors was all the, all, all the exotic weapons. So we're yeah, great yeah, going yeah, around. We're, in a, yeah, yeah. we're in a minority though, Jerry. Oh well, yeah, I know. <laughs> But right. it's bare weapons to Jerry, right? It, oh no, yeah. But the thing is, they were absolutely useless because yeah. <laughs> fighting with they were decorative and, and, and exotic and different and unusual. Um, there was a collector mechanism, and uh, all I needed was a player who liked collecting things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, I don't know how he chose me. <laughs> no, I, I mean the good. The other good thing is, of course, for uh, coming back to Beck there and and uh, his game. You know, I think that that. You could just imagine the opportunity for more cards in the game <laughs> as you do the legacy. Uh, absolutely. So I was just thinking, why can't we just have more components in one game? You get a new set of cards every hour or whatever. That's how it works. Uh, yeah, yeah stickers on them. Popular. Exactly. <laughs> it's also it's also interesting to think about whether the the characters change. You know, one of the things with novels is you know, sort of like Agatha Christie. They said like. Um, uh, uh, her, her Q Poirot or, or um, Miss Marple, they didn't actually change as characters. And so it sort of became the same old all the time. But you, know, you get other ones where, especially some of the crime ones, where the detective sort of evolves or um, as a character and becomes more understandable and all those sorts of things, whether that yeah. would actually develop, happen in games, you know, that you'd have some where the characters might just keep playing um true to the themselves or would those characters actually develop and evolve as well, a result of playing with the game i'm reminded of um some uh, some views of henry the eighth who 
was um, reportedly quite nice until he had a fall off his horse or something oh. like that, had some accident and a mm. head injury and then became a complete dick. And so, and started killing people and being really unpleasant. And it's like, well, that we might now diagnose that as, as some sort of brain damage. Mm. And, uh, but in game term, uh, in history, people do change. Mm. Yeah. And so you could, and, and so, you know, that, that's kind of interesting to see how we do, we can do that by slotting a different player into the same character. We can see how that, that, you know, that, that there's some, it's not unreasonable um, and can be quite interesting. And also, mm. also there is, I think, coming back to the character development thing, in role playing games, it's a standard, it's a standard trope of character development. You know, you gain experience points, you gain abilities, you develop your, your character over time. Mm. Um, we don't do that in mega games because it's they're too short. It's, you, you don't really get much. Occasionally, we have things like, well, if a general wins some battles, they'll get a plus one or something. But um, the idea that that you might maintain a character, or it might not be a character, it might be um, a family or mm. it might be a faction over time, and it gains powers or abilities or characteristics. Uh, that might have. There might be some. Mileage in that. No, no, you got me thinking about dinner kind of Arthurian Pendragon type game where you have a family game to game with an each new generation of knights doing their own. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I think probably we're, we're, we're definitely down into anecdote territory now. Um, I, thank you very much for sticking with the program. And uh, it's been a very stimulating uh, session for me. Um, so thank you all. And um, I think we'll, well, hand, hand to Chris. Is there anything you want to say, Chris? Uh, no, that was a brilliant session. Thank you much, Jim. Um, I think it was great that you included everybody in there uh, in sort of taking on their thoughts and, and, and how they would design their Watch Sky Legacy. But no, really good. Thank you. Um, obviously, the, the conversation continue in the pub in Discord if anybody wants to make um, make any comments in there or ask any questions. And um, that'd be great. But uh, yeah, that's, that's cool. We can call it there. Thank you. Thank you.